Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Before Coffee. It is Wacky and Weird Wednesday. We're going to be talking about the wacky and weird news we found today and over the week. It's Before Coffee, the father and daughter comprehensive news of planet Earth, where we look at our news stories, our news headlines, 10 to 15 minutes before we start, and um, hopefully find some weird and wacky ones without any caffeine in our body. Let's look at those headlines today on Before Coffee. 11 people on trial in Sweden for largest environmental crime with the Trash Queen. And new study shows how long dogs can remember your name for. Former aide to New York State Governor is charged as, as a Chinese government agent. Science is stunned to find large sharks hunting each other in the Atlantic. And earthquakes can trigger quartz into forming giant gold nuggets. There's otter poo, dragon poo, the woman who can make you smell everything from hell to your grandparents. And it's National Macadamia Nut Day, so get your nuts ready. It's September 4th, 2024 on Before Coffee. Let's get started with our first smelly story about the largest environmental crime in Sweden's history. The waste management company Think Pink is accused of dumping at least 200,000 tons of rubbish in Sweden. This is by Euronos Green. The case has been described as the worst, or sorry, the largest environmental crime in Sweden in terms of scope and organization by one of the trial's three prosecutors, Anders Gustafsson. He told broadcaster SVT there were claims for damages of 260 million Swedish krona, which is near 23 million euro, mainly for municipalities who were forced to clear away large mountains of rubbish. Gustafsson said the defendants also used the falsified documents in order to mislead the authorities and make a lot of money. Among those on trial is Bella Nilsson, who has since changed her name, the former CEO of the defunct waste management firm Think Pink, who once dubbed herself the Queen of Trash and her ex-husband Thomas Nilsson. The company has been accused of dumping or burning at least 200,000 tons of waste from the Stockholm area at 21 locations in 15 municipalities across Sweden with no attention or ability to handle it in line with environmental legislation. Ah, the classic just, oh, I don't know what to do with this trash. Let's make it somebody else's problem. Prosecutors said they had to limit the case to just 21 locations because they ran out of time. So there's even more than 21 locations that they've dumped trash. They just, there's too many to even count. It's, police investigation runs, the police investigation runs to more than 45,000 pages with 150 witnesses due to testify during the trial. The waste allegedly dumped, including items like building materials, electronics, metals, plastic, toys, and tires. Prosecutors say the high levels of arsenic, lead, dioxins, copper, zinc, petrol products, and carcinogenic materials known as PCBs were released in the air, soil, and water. Several of the rubbish dumps also caught on fire. One of the biggest claims for damages comes from Botkrika, Council where two waste piles burned for months in 2020 and 2021. The Nilsons faced charges of serious, oh, serious environmental crime and serious economic crime linked to the company. The rest of the accused are facing a combination of different charges which include serious environmental crime, aiding and abetting serious environmental crime, and environmental crime in general. All 11 people have denied committing any crime. Yeah, so we jumped some trash in your backyard. That's not our problem. Uh, Bella Nilsson, who has since changed her name to FOP. North Korea? Huh? Oh, yeah, North Korea. They're also doing. Uh, what do you think they are? North Korea? Yeah, illegal dumping. Fariba Van Kor, she changed her name to Fariba Van Kor, previously told Swedish media that the company acted in line with law and that she was the victim of a plot by a rival business. She has an explanation for all of this, her lawyer Jan Tibling told Swedish newspaper Dagens Nyheter on Monday, which was. Um, the 2nd of September. Think Tink's bright colored waste bags are once a common sight on the streets of Stockholm and won a prestigious Swedish business prize award. 
The company was hired by a variety of clients, including municipalities, construction companies, and private individuals to recycle building and demolition waste. It collapsed in 2020 when its owners were arrested. The prosecutor is requesting a 10-year ban on owning a business for the three main defendants and two more involved, which is also contested by the defendants. The trial is expected to continue until May 2025. So, uh, I guess... Hopefully next year we'll have some updates on the trash queen and her nefarious crimes of dumping trash into people's backyards. In more news, a new study shows how long dogs can remember names for. This wacky, the wacky memory of dogs. Certain dogs can remember the names for their toys for at least two years, scientists have found. This is by Nilma Marshall on The Independent. Previous research has shown these rare pooches, known as gifted word learners, GWL, have a unique ability to learn the names of hundreds of different objects. A new study published in the Journal of Biology Letters now suggests that they can remember the names of some of these toys for an extended period of time. That's right, your dog may not have goldfish memory like you thought. The hope is that the talented dogs can help scientists understand more about animals and other than humans retain their memories. Dr. Claudia Fugaza, the head of the research group at Otvos Loran University in Hungary, said, We know that dogs can remember events for at least 24 hours, in orders for up to one year. But this is the first study showing that some talented dogs can remember words for at least two years. The findings of our current study cannot be generalized to other dogs because we only tested GWL dogs, individuals that show a special talent for acquiring object words. For the study, the research analyzed the behavior of five border collies, Gaia, Max, and Whiskey, Squall, and Rico. These GWL dogs had learnt and remembered the names of multiple toys and were tested again two years on. The researcher said that remarkably, four out of five dogs remember the names of between 60 to 75% of toys after two years, with Gaia performing the best. As a group, the dog's performance averaged at 44% correct choices, which is significantly above the chance level, the team added. Dr. Shani Dor, the leader of the researcher on the study at Etwolf's Loran University said, we waited two years and then decided to test the dogs again to see if they still remembered the toys' names. Because such a long time has passed, some of the owners lost a few of the toys. Thus, three dogs were tested on 12 toys and one dog on 11 and one dog on five. Lost almost half more than half the toys for this one dog, chewed them all up into little pieces. After two years, we are, had all had a hard time remembering the names of the toys, but the dogs, they did not seem to struggle at all. The research is part of a project known as the Genius Dog Challenge, and the scientists are urging owners who believe their dog to know multiple toy names to contact them via the project's website. So if you have a genius dog out there, or you think your dog's a genius, Move to Hungary and let them study and find out for themselves. That's my two stories. On to yours. Okay, in the U.S., we have a Chinese agent arrested who used to work for the New York State Governor. This is from Dan Clark from the TimesUnion.com. A former deputy chief of staff to Governor Kathy Hochul and her husband were charged on Tuesday with acting on behalf of the Chinese government to influence state officials and policy in New York in exchange for millions of that the U.S. Justice Department said helped fund their luxurious lifestyle. Linda Sun, 41, who was fired from the State Department of Labor last March, and her husband, Chris Hu, 40, were indicted Tuesday in Brooklyn by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York. They are charged with violating and conspiring to violate the Foreign Agents Registration Act, Visa Fraud, Alien Smuggling, and Money Laundering Conspiracy. The team enriched the defendant's family to the tune of millions of dollars, U.S. Attorney Brian Peace. Our office will act decisively to prosecute those who serve as undisclosed agents of foreign government. Indictment in sealed Tuesday morning alleges that Sun actively approved work to prevent representatives of the Taiwanese government from meeting with high-ranking New York officials, including Hochul and former governor Andrew Cuomo. This was at the direction of the Chinese government, which asked Sun to prevent those meetings from taking place. 
China still claims Taiwan is its territory, but the island has declared its own sovereignty for the nation. Tensions between the two countries has intensified recently, and both countries have been conducting mock military drills. Sun's alleged intervention to prevent the meeting started as early as 2016, according to the indictment, when Sun worked as an external international affairs at Empire State Development, New York's economic development agency, according I mean, during the Cuomo administration. In exchange for these and other acts, the Chinese government consulate provided Sun and her family with gifts, including tickets to shows, concerts, and events, as well as salted ducks prepared by a Chinese officials' personal chef, the indictment said. The indictment also recounted how Sun blocked Hokul, then the lieutenant governor, from meeting with officials from Taipei during a reception in Washington, D.C., hosted by the China General Chamber of Commerce in 2016. Hochul is not named in the indictment, but is the only politician from New York who attended the reception. It's all been taken care of satisfactorily, Sun told the official, the, the Chinese official at the consulate at the event at the meeting. He then said, <clears throat> a spokesman for Hochul on Tuesday said that her administration fired Sun last year after they found what they perceived to be misconduct and reported those actions to federal prosecutors. This individual was hired by the executive chamber more than a decade ago, said Abby Small, the governor's spokesman. We terminated her employment in March 23 after discovering evidence of misconduct, immediately reported her actions to law enforcement and assisted law enforcement throughout this process. Sun began her career in New York government as a chief of staff to assemblywoman Grace Meng, who is now a member of Congress. She was then hired by Cuomo's administration as Director of Asian American Affairs, according to a LinkedIn profile. Her, she subsequently served in various roles at the Department of Labor, Empire State Development, and the State Department of Financial Services before landing in Hobo's office as Deputy Chief of Staff in 20, September of 21. Sun also made considerable efforts to influence, influence policy under Cuomo, whose office hired her as Deputy Chief Diversity Officer in 2018. Cuomo's name doesn't appear in the indictment, which refers to him as Politician 1. When Cuomo received a handful of invitations from Taiwanese officials in 2019, the indictment alleges that Sun either advised against accepting them or blocked them outright when that power was in her hands. The Taipei Economic and Cultural Office Director of Political Affairs wrote Sun to invite Cuomo to attend Taiwan's National Day event. Indictment states, Sun advised against attending the event. Those efforts continued when Hochul's office brought her on as Deputy Chief of Staff after a short time working in the Department of Financial Services. Sun allegedly directed staff not to have Hochul recognize Taiwanese American Heritage Week, for example, writing in the email, please do not issue, and later asked that the invitation for Hochul to meet with a Taiwanese ambassador be declined. But her activities on behalf of the Chinese government extend beyond preventing contact with Taiwan, the indictment alleges. Sun allegedly forced Hockle's, forged Hakul's signature when she was lieutenant governor on a letter that invited a delegation from the province of Henan in China to New York. The handwritten signature was falsified, the indictment states. Sun did not have authorization to sign documents on Hokel's behalf. As recently as January, Sun also used her position, position in Hokel's office to obtain gubernatorial proclamation for a Chinese official, according to the indictment. She did that by working directly with an employee from the Office of Correspondence, the indictment said, and didn't get approval for it. The employee sent the framed proclamation to Sun's personal address in Long Island. Sun sent the Office of Correspondence employee who created the proclamation a personal gift basket and claimed to have sent and claims to have sent to an employee wine. That, that sentence makes no sense. <laughs> he claimed to have sent employees some wine, I guess. They looked at a couple of articles in that sentence. The couple who are charged with violating and conspiring, conspiring to violate the Foreign Agents Registration Act, visa fraud, alien smuggling, and money laundering conspiracy. Sun benefited greatly from these actions, as did who, according to the indictment, including connections for business activities in China. But is who on first? That's what I want to know. I'm just kidding. Old joke. The defendant, Chris Hu, China's based business activities, generated millions of dollars in China, which he and Sun 
used to purchase real estate properties and luxury automobiles, including a 2024 Ferrari Roma. The indictment said wow. sudden salary in Hochul's office was $140,000 a year in 2021, according to the C through New York. A database of public salaries compiled by the Empire Center, a nonprofit think tank in Albany. The indictment alleges that Sun and Who laundered the money, monetary proceeds from the payments, which Sun never listed in financial disclosure forms, to purchase property in Manhattan, valued at $4.1 million, and a condominium in Honolulu, Hawaii, valued at $2.1 million. So, yeah, there you are, a couple of grifters getting rich. Uh, Giving, and giving access to the state government to China and denying it to Taiwan. And enjoy your time in prison. You don't get to keep those houses that you bought with your laundered money. Sorry. Nope. You're gonna have to sell them. I'm talking about being in a high position and falling down all the way low. Yeah, Good for well, a senator and now it's laundering a, money. Kind of a, just a technical advisor small time bureaucrat make hundred and forty thousand dollars you can still cash in as a foreign agent. Unregistered no, though, that's in. illegal. You can register yeah. as a foreign agent. You can register as a foreign agent with everything you do it. You're probably gonna lose your job for one thing. You can't work as a foreign agent. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Uh next story, uh talking about having loan sharks. Let's talk about actual sharks and they're eating each other for some reason. This is our weird and wacky animal story. This is from Vishwam Sankaran on The Independent. It is, the incident comes to light after female shark satellite tag starts to transmit off Bermuda five months after its release. Scientists have documented the world's first known case of a shark eaten by a larger predator in the open sea southwest of Bermuda. In one of the incidents, a reproductive female pork eagle shark native to the Atlantic not only lost her life, but also all of her developing pups. The findings reported yesterday on the 3rd of September in the journal Frontiers in Marine Science is verified and found to be true could be hold significance for the conservation of both species which are considered endangered by the UN researchers say. Predation of one of our pregnant pork eagles was an unexpected discovery, study co-opter Brooke Anderson said. Pork beagle shark live in the Atlantic and South Pacific Oceans, as well as the Mediterranean, growing into powerful beasts measuring around 4 meters long and weighing up to 230 kilograms. Even though they are known to live up to 30 or even 65 years, females of the species do not reproduce until they are about 13 years old. Similar to humans, then. Females give birth to an average of only about four pups every year or two after a gestation period between eight and nine months, very much like humans. Due to a slow reproductive cycle, these shark populations do not recover quickly from ongoing levels of fishing and habitat loss. To, the study, to study this vulnerable species, scientists captured and released pork beagles off Cape Cod in Massachusetts in 2020 and 2022 after mounting them with satellite tags. These tags sent current locations to satellites whenever their fin rose above the surface. One of the tag sharks was pregnant female pork beagle measuring about 2.2 meters long. Researchers hope to track the female and obtain her tag data to identify important habitats for pork beagle mothers and their newborns. But to their dismay, the female shark satellite tag started to transmit off Bermuda five months after its release, implying that it had popped off. Data retrieved by the scientists suggested that data during those five months, the shark had been swimming at a depth of around 100 to 100 meters at night and 600 to 800 meters during the day, confirming she was swimming underwater most of the time. But suddenly, from 24th March 20 on, 2021 onward, for about four days, the shark seemed to have been constantly at a depth between 150 and 600 meters. Only one exception was possible that day. The unfortunate pork beetle had been hunted and eaten by a larger predator scientists say. Within the vicinity, researchers say only two predator candidates, both sharks, are large enough to prey on mature pork beagles, the great white shark and the short fin mako. They suspect the great white shark is more likely to be the culprit as the short fin mako dives to deeper depths during the day. We often think of large sharks as being apex predators, but with technological advancements, we have started to discover that large predator interactions could be even more complex than previously thought, Dr. Anderson said. We need to continue study, studying the predator interactions to estimate how often large sharks hunt each other. 
be added. So that's right. Uh, sharks are eating each other. They don't care if uh, they're both the same species. Well, not the same species, really, but um, similar species, let's just say. They're in the same family. But uh, just because they're family doesn't mean you can't eat each other, right, guys? So, <laughs> there's your sad and wacky news coming from um, shark. Shark uh, study. Shark, shark study. Week. Yeah. Not Shark Week. I don't even know when Shark Week is, but uh, it's Shark Week for shark that great white shark. <laughs> Sharksburg. Sharkstown. That's my story. All right. From sharks to gold. Not a good transition, but it's there. This is from lifescience.com or livescience.com or livescience.com. Earthquakes can trigger quartz. This is written by Shasha Pare. Earthquake can trigger quartz into forming giant gold nuggets. So next time there's an earthquake, you might just start hacking away at the ground, finding that gold. Still gonna be, still gonna be hard to find. Hacking away at the gold. Uh, scientists have discovered exactly how earthquakes, how earthquakes trigger quartz into forming large gold nuggets, finally solving a mystery that's puzzled researchers for decades. Gold naturally forms in quartz, the second most abundant mineral in Earth's crust after feldspar. But unlike other types of gold deposits, these found in quartz often cluster into giant nuggets. These nuggets float in the middle of what geologists call quartz veins, which are cracks in the quartz-rich rocks that periodically get pumped full of hydrothermal fluids from deep within the crust. Which quartz is uh, silica. It's basically just crystallized silica. Gold okay. forms in quartz all the time, says Chris Voicey, a geologist at Monash University in Australia, and the lead author of a new study published Monday, September 2nd in the journal Nature Geoscience. The thing that's weird is really, really large gold nugget formation. We don't know how that works. How you get a large volume of gold to mineralize in one discreet little place, Voicey told Life Science. Hydrothermal fluids carry gold atoms from the deep and flush them through quartz veins, meaning gold should theoretically become evenly spread in the cracks rather than con concentrated in the nuggets, voice he said. These nuggets are exceptionally valuable and represent up to 75% of all the gold ever mined, according to the study. Two separate clues helped Voicey and his colleagues solve the gold nugget mystery, he said. The first was that the largest nuggets occur in orogenic gold deposits, which are deposits that form during earthquakes. The second was that quartz is a piezoelectric mi mineral, meaning it creates its own electrical charge in response to geologic stress, such as the stress generated by earthquakes. Yes, quartz, I don't know if a lot of people you will know this. Quartz were the first radio crystals. You had a quartz crystal tuned to a specific frequency and you electrically charge it and it gives off radio waves. And radio was invented from quartz. It could also be generated from diamonds, but diamonds are a lot more expensive. When you actually put it together, it almost works out a bit too neat. The researchers found that Earthquakes fracture rocks and force hydrothermal fluids up to the quartz veins, filling them with dissolved gold. In response to the stress of the earthquake, quartz veins simultaneously generate an electric charge that reacts with the gold, causing it to precipitate and solidify. Gold concentrates in specific spots because gold dissolved in a solution will preferentially deposit onto pre-existing gold veins. Voice, he said, gold is essentially acting as an electrode for further reactions by adopting the voltage generated by the nearby quartz crystals. This means that quartz veins gold that this means that in quartz veins gold solidifies into clusters that grow bigger with each earthquake. The largest volcanic no, I'm sorry, the largest orogenic gold nuggets found to, to date weigh around 130 pounds or 60 kilograms. Voice, he said, in quartz veins. Gold preferably solidifies in existing gold deposits, forming large clusters of nuggets. To test this theory, this idea, the researchers simulated the effect of the earthquake on 
quartz crystals in the laboratory. They submerge the crystals in a liquid containing gold and replace, I'm sorry, and re replicated seismic waves to generate a piezoelectric charge. The experiment confirmed that under geologic stress, quartz can produce large enough voltage to precipitate gold out of the solution. This, this simulation also confirmed that gold that gold preferentially solidifies on top of existing gold deposits and quartz veins, which helps explain the formation of large gold nuggets. Having pre-existing gold and having become basically the catalyst or lightning rod that other gold would attract was very, very exciting. One of the implications of the study is that scientists can now make very large gold nuggets in the lab, but it's not up to me. Boise said you have to have gold in a solution and you have to just move it from basically being a liquid just sticking it to someone else, to something else, or someone else. However, the results don't give geologists and exploration companies new clues as to where to mine for gold nuggets. The best science can offer is now is a device that detects piezoelectric signals to quartz at depth, Boise said. This can tell you where the quartz veins are, but not tell you if there's gold in those quartz veins. There's gold in them dark quartz veins. Sasha is a UA. Is UK based trainee staff writer at Life's oh, We're talking about the author of the article. Anyway, there's your story. Sorry about the biography from the author at the end, but we don't need to know our biography. <laughs> Only if we're going <laughs> to write a book. Know about about the there's author. your story. <laughs> yeah, quartz. <laughs> quartz has piezoelectric properties that draw gold into huge nuggets. Man, it'll be cool to find a. 160 pound nugget, wouldn't it? That would be so. Yeah, that would be. I agree. You can retire for, you can retire for five generations. <laughs> anyway, back to you. Okay. Right. In culture news, we're going to talk about uh, the scientist who's able to make you smell anything. She's a genius at scent design. This is from Amin Sonner on The Guardian. If you wish to know what the cesspit of a Norman fortress smelled like, Sasha Marks has ventured there. Go to Roster's castle, descend the dank steps, and put your nose to the smell chamber. What rich delight awaits! It's not just the stink of human excre excrement and urine. We know that there was food waste in there, says Marks, and animal waste. Marks says she is never sure what to describe herself as, but set designer, historian, and artist comes close. When a perfumer blends alluring scents for the body, Marx creates custom-made odors for spaces, usually museums, galleries, and historic buildings. I work closely with curators around the developing a smell, she says. They send me lots of information. It doesn't have to be smell-related. I just want to know everything about it, begin to imagine what it might smell like. From there, Marx works with chemists and perfumers to help her blend aromas and with fragrance libraries that have all manners of scents, including the worst. There's otter poo, dragon poo, there's one just called poo. It isn't about authentically recreating a smell, she says of her evocative work. It's about storytelling. Marx has arranged a selection of scents for um, Emin to test when she was doing this interview at her dining room table at her home in London, where she lived with her wife, lives with her wife and their super sniffing corgi. If she had expected to be full of intoxicating scents and mysterious files like an alchemist's laboratory, she was a little disappointed. It smells clean and homely. The only clues to Mark's works are a jar of sugar containing small lumps of ambergris, which is whale vomit, basically once prized as a perfumer's ingredient. A wooden cabinet stuffed with curios, such as antique jelly molds, and a 3D replica of her nose hung up high on the wall. The nose is a keepsake from an artwork she installed this year, a wall of 360 noses named the Noseum in the new fragrance area in Liberty Department Store in London. She dips strips of paper in a bottle containing a breast milk scent. Together they sniff, they sniff the warm bodily aroma. It isn't just milky, it also has a sweet powderness that many of us might instantly associate with baby products. It was made for the Welcome Collection permanent exhibition Being Human, which opened in 2019. Marx scented a bronze sculpture to evoke breast milk, a work she titled 531. Here we go. This is funny. 531 8008. 
Now everyone with a calculator knows what 8008 is. And 131, if you point it upside down, spells boobies! <laughs> she, she titled the work boobies if you wrote it on a calculator. If you ever... The pudding sweetness comes from the vanillin in it. The odor compound of vanilla, she explains. It's also the thing that old books smell of. When books get old and start to age, they release vanillin, which is why we like the smell of them. Oh, because it reminds us of mommy's milk. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay. Marx is working on a project for the British Library, an exhibition about the lives of medieval women, women which opens in autumn. As well as the 11th century hair perfume and breath freshener, Marx has created Heaven on Hell since, inspired by descriptions of two female saints who experienced olfactory spiritual revelations. We sniff hell first, not sulfuric as you might imagine, because, says Marx, museums don't like sulfuric compound. It plays havoc with conservation efforts. So this is much more fecal, a bit smoky, but it's not hideous. You don't want to be so repulsive that people are retching in the exhibition. You want it to be challenging, but I could have made it worse. The heaven sent me while sweet, but not sickly. There are some synthetic compounds in here, not for nature, says Marx, of the otherworldly element wanted to include an artificial but in a pleasant way during the covid pandemic many people temporarily lost their sense of smell sometimes with disastrous results including depression loneliness and loss of appetite perhaps titling how we previously undervalued this sense i've never undervalued smelling but that's me personally <laughs> If Mark's workload this year is anything to go by, there may be a newfound interest and respect for scent. As well as the British Library exhibition, she is doing historic aromas for the National Trust property, including the Reek of Battle, Bloody and Smoky, Mulchy and Earthy, and for Hastings Museum and Art Gallery, including one reminiscent of a dinosaur habitat, a bit volcanic, swampy, and vegetal. Smell has this great advantage that you have to be there to experience it, she says. So it brings people into museums and galleries is a nice collective experience, public experience. Marx is not a natural super smeller, although she is pregnant and like many in pregnancy, she has a heightened sense of smell. She has trained herself to perceive odors better and says we can all do the same. Smell is a very undertrained sense. Generally, we don't let it use we don't learn to use it on its own. We don't like think to smell things or explore with our noses. So for me, the biggest shift was learning to be aware of what I was smelling. You can't turn your nose off. We're smelling all the time. But to pay attention is more of an active choice. I do do that. I guess that's why I'm a great smeller. Because I'm if I smell something, I'm like, what is that? Do you smell that? Like a dog. It's all about curiosity. And I definitely have that curiosity. <sighs> Scents are so entwined with memory and emotion. Because the way you process smell is different from other senses. It goes through our olfactory bulb, which is at the front of the brain. That also is responsible for our memories and a lot of our emotions. You have a much more visceral response to smell memories. When she was developing her breast milk scent, she went to a milk bank that collects and distributes donated breast milk to babies in need. And they warmed up a sample for her to sniff. I had such a visceral reaction to it that I must have unlocked a cool memory. <laughs> Uh, she's like, oh, this reminds me of when I was a baby. When many people lost their sense of smell during COVID infection, she says, one of the things they really struggled with was, I can't smell my kids. It's not something we're really aware of, but when you realize you can't, these things suddenly feel alien. A sense of smell does decrease with age, but also we don't train it, Mark says. Smell becomes very integrated with our other senses. We learn that smell means taste, and we learn to associate objects with certain smells, because how they look. You have your eyes closed and you smell rosemary and lavender side by side, most people struggle to tell them apart. That's not possible, is that? Oh my god, those smell totally different. Crazy. Even language can affect our perception of odors. Mark hands a bottle of scent she's working on for the Lowry Art Center in Salford. This is the smell of Salford, 1910. Quite industrial, imagining the horses and carts and the bricks. As soon as she says the word brick, you mean gets a hit of rain-soaked brickwork? Exactly, says Mox. Our sense of smell is really suggestible. As a society, though, we have become less tolerant of odor. We've sterilized a lot of our smells. Cleanliness associated with the removal of smell, says Mark. So the smell of clean for a lot of people is the absence of smell. That think about all the bouquets we are missing out on. The multi-sensory world that could be open to us if we only twitched our nostrils. 
We have a lot to gain from it, she says. I think the best thing we can do is be more aware of what we're smelling. Really start to treasure your nose and to think with smell. So there you go. There's your weird homework for today. Go smell things. Bad things, good things. You know, what does that smell like? What does this smell like, you know? Yeah, it smells like dust and old, oldness, because this is pretty old. I don't even know when this it does. I cut the tag off, so I don't know when it was made, but you know, there's just an example of something. Just go smell stuff, learn, educate your nose. That's your homework. Your weird, wacky, and weird homework. Go educate your nose. On to this day in history. Alrighty, this day in history. The state history in the year 925, King Ethelstan, Ethelstan of the West Saxons became the first king to rule all of England. Yeah, put them druids in their place. 1768, French author and diplomat Francois Auguste René, Vicomte de Chateaubriand, who was one of the fir country's first romantic writers in France's preeminent literary literary figure early century early 19th century is born. It was a happy birthday to him. 1864 is uh, the day that John Hunt Morgan, the Confederate guerrilla leader of Morgan's Raiders, was killed by federal troops. Civil War. 1870, Napoleon III, who ruled France first as president in 1850 to 1852, and then as emperor and from 1852 to 1870, was deposed and the Third Republic proclaimed. So they get tired of having a Napoleon and said, that's enough for the Napoleons. Let's go back to being a republic, the Third Republic. 1908, novelist and story writer Richard Wright was born. He was among the first African-American writers to protest white treatment of blacks. 1957, the Ford Motor Company introduced the Edsel automobile, which was perhaps its most notable failure. Of course, Edsel was named after okay. uh, Henry Ford's son, whose first name was Edsel. And it was one of the marketing failures. So well, not a bad car necessarily, it just didn't sell. 1972, American swimmer Mark Spitz won his seventh gold medal during the Munich Olympic Games, the first person ever to do so in a single Olympics. Mark Spitz. And on the same day in 1972, a revival of The Price is Right began airing with Bob Barker as host. It was a huge hit, becoming one of the longest running game shows on American television. It's still on with Drew Carey as host. 1989, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, and the U.S. Air Force launched, launched, or launched, the word launched. They launched the last Titan III rocket. 1998, the American search engine Google Inc. was formally established as founders Sergey Brin and Larry Page filed incorporation papers. These guys look like they're 12 years old. <laughs> oh, great. 12-year-olds becoming billionaires. Love and it. Now, and now our lives are ruined by Google. God damn it. That's why you don't let 12 year olds open the business. As we, as we curse <laughs> YouTube and our algorithms. Yeah. Well, to be fair, YouTube was made by somebody else. But may, I think uh, maybe Google yeah, introduced Google the algorithms. Google owns it now. Yeah. Google owns uh, uh, YouTube. That's all we need to know. We can complain to these guys. 2002 American singer Kelly Clarkson became the first winner of the reality show American Idol. So happy anniversary to Kelly Clarkson, who's now a big old talk show host. 2006, Australian wildlife concert sad day on, on a weird Wednesday, commemorating this sad day. Australian wildlife conservation and television personality Steve Irwin was killed by a venomous bull stinger in 2006 on this day. He achieved worldwide fame as a risk-taking host of the crocodile hunt. 1992 to 2006, which his wife and his, or so his widow and his children have taken over the, uh, taken over the crazy croc hunting, grabbing animals that don't want to be grabbed. 
<laughs> Said day for the world of conservation. 2014 American Not another weird death. This is weird also. Non-ironic death. You think Steve Irwin died a non-ironic death? Because he figured that's kind of the way you go handling some animal. Joan Rivers also died in a uh, kind of an ironic death. She was died in New York City on this day in 2014 for undergoing plastic surgery, which she's oh, made jokes about at some point. basically yeah. dozens of times went under the knife for mm -hmm. plastic surgery, but this time she went under the knife and didn't come back. Uh, was, she, anyway, Joan Rivers first gained fame in the 1960s as a nightclub on the television comic, a, a pioneer of stand-up comic. Known for her catchphrase, Can We Talk, who later critiqued celebrities' wardrobes. It kind of minimizes her biography. She was actually a uh, trailblazer in common. She's actually quite funny. 2016, Mar Mother Teresa was canonized by Pope Francis II. Uh, I don't know. Not exactly a saint. I'm not, I'm not really sold on what the Mother Teresa is or anything but an opportunist. But hey, you know, she got... Catholic Church gonna do their thing, but uh, she basically just let people die in their dying rooms that are in Calcutta. While they, oh my God, pray for pray for health. She told them as they died, with no hope whatsoever of ever getting any medical treatment because hope is not medicine. And our featured event, 1781, Los Angeles was founded on this day. Happy birthday, Los Angeles! On this day in 1781, Spanish settlers laid claim to what became Los Angeles, now the second most populous U.S. city and home to Hollywood. His name is synonymous with the American motion picture industry, so we have to bring up Hollywood. It's the only reason to remember Los Angeles. Nothing else. <laughs> Los Angeles. It's Fritcher Biography, whose birthday is it today? It's Beyonce's birthday. She only known by one name now, Beyonce. I think it's Beyonce Knowles, right? Is her last name? September 4th, see, I don't even remember what her last name was. September 4th, 1981. So she turns 43 today. Although Britannica claims she's only 42. And she was born in Hurt, Houston, Texas. Other birthdays today, Dada. Dada Bhai Naroji, Indian nationalist leader, born in 1825. Antonin Artraud, French author and actor, born in 1896. Richard Wright, American writer, born in 1908. Not the keyboard player for Pink Floyd. I don't think he was born in 1908. But he's also, I don't know, on his birthday. It's also Henry Ford's birthday. So Henry Ford II's birthday, sorry. Born in 1917. Uh, Edsel's brother. Apparently, right? Born on this day. What a coincidence. I don't know. I don't know if it's a coincidence or not. We already covered Beyonce. And what day is it today? It's National Wildlife Day. National Newspaper Carrier Day. Newspapers? What's that? And National Macadamia Nut Day. The National Nut of, of Hawaii. Not the wise nation, and it's National Spice Blend Day. Gotta get that spice blend. So blend those spices. Yeah, blend those spices. Add a little color to your kind food. Of Self-explanatory. <laughs> yeah, get in that spice rack and see which spices go. Worst thing that has happened is that you puke your guts out, right? <laughs> yeah. Little, little upper GI problem we got now for all those spices. But there's your stories and there's your days for September 4th, 2024 on Before Macadamias. Now go nuts! Yeah, go nuts! All right, this has been Allison here from the Netherlands and I forgot to do this at the beginning of the show, but I would like to celebrate our 100th subscriber. That's right. Woo, yeah. Big clapping. Woo ding, 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 ding. Whoa, whoa. Uh, 100 oh. subscriber, which Happy is... Days oh, are here there. again. Where did I have that open? Here it is. Think before you act is our 100th subscriber on the Alien Ross channel. I'd like to thank all our subscribers Way to go. for being here. 100 is a really hard number to get to, especially on a it's fresh us. channel. It's us. That started on zero, and, and on we Google's didn't buy birthday. any of our viewers, we didn't buy any of our subs, so 
This is all great uh, grassroots campaigning here to get our subscribers. Appreciate right. all of you. Uh, Google's tomorrow, the algorithm, and YouTube's yeah, algorithm, algorithm is not helping at all. At all. <laughs> thanks, algorithm. Maybe we'll get some new algorithm now. 100! Don't forget yeah, to like. Yeah. That counts too. Yeah. I would like to thank everyone, and we will be back tomorrow for Thursday's 13, where Rod will draw up a list of 13 things, oh boy, and it's going to be a surprise, so make sure you subscribe if you're not already. Turn on those notification bells so you know when we go live, and uh, like this video if you enjoyed us having to restart it halfway through. <laughs> if yeah. you watch this live, please like the video when we Glitches post it on the... Uh, when we post the fully glitchy, glitchy, glitchy. edited version since <laughs> oh what a mess glitchy. okay but that's it for us let's go to our mic drop moment ladies that's the ed song and gentlemen, the Ford i love the old stuff commercial like stuff yeah the new styling the new features of the beautiful new what Madison Avenue thought we'd all be into in 1958. Like I, I like the car, man. I wish I owned the one that worked a lot. Because I wish my what? dad would have bought it that song, just put it in the garage and left it there. Never. What fascinating editing. They're using cards and then they... Oh, yeah. Oh, this is so long. Are commercials this long today? I don't watch TV anymore. These, these might have run. These might have run before movies at the theater. Uh, just between. But who knows? There's never been a car like the Fifty Edsel. Wow, it can fit three people on the chair. Oh yeah. Three adult oh, yeah. humans. Drive on the steering wheel seat. Look at that chrome. The way you can open the wow, the little controls on the carriage steering wheel for the first time. That reliable ignition. But what about prices? Yeah, how much is it? You can get They're gonna say two hundred bucks and I'm gonna be like oh. <laughs> it's the only one that's really different. The Ford Motor Company built it so you know it's good. How does it feel to own an Edsel? It's like falling in love. <laughs> you can read about it, hear about it, but you exactly like falling in love. And they're all made out of hard metal, so you could really do some damage with those old cars. <laughs> Not aluminum and plastic like Don't today. 1958. 1958 was still the post-war boom where people had disposable income. And you yep. could buy a car for two thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars. You know. Consumerism. I mean, Thirty-five bucks a week, but oh yeah. Well, don't forget also the middle class. Be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons, and follow our other channels: Toxic Alley, History of Gravy, and Scratchy Old Records.